welcome to Barnyard Language. We are Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. So kick off your boots, reheat your coffee, and join us for some Barnyard Language, honest talk about running farms and raising families. In case your kids haven't already learned all the swears from being in the barn, it might be a good idea to put on some headphones or turn down the volume. While many of our guests are professionals, they aren't your professionals. If you need personalized advice, consult your people. Welcome to another episode of Barnyard Language. It's Arlene and Katie here, as usual. And Katie, what is going on on the farm in Iowa? What's the update? Well, Arlene, we're trying out some new recording software today. So if this episode sounds way better, that's why. And if this episode sounds terrible, that's why. Um, yeah, it's new. It sound great. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I have faith. Um, other than that, we moved the cows out on corn stalks last week, so I got a lot of work done while I was not sleeping because we had, we, uh, weaned some calves and there was a lot of noise, so I, uh, was able to get up extra early, benefits of a flexible remote job, and get some extra work done. Um, other than that, not a lot. It's cold, it's windy. Thanksgiving happened. What's the update? Thanksgiving happened. Um, there was a shit ton of food. and Are you still eating it? I, no, in a wasteful but beneficial twist of fate, the turkey carcass got popped back in the oven to protect it from the cats. And then I had a migraine Thanksgiving afternoon, and so the turkey carcass was still in the oven the next day. Got it. Um, which really So it went to the cats leftovers. anyway? Yeah, the barn cats really appreciated it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, lots of food. And I made another pumpkin pie this week because I only got one little slice on Thanksgiving. And oh, that is not enough. I, I freaking love pumpkin pie. So I just made it. Did you know there's like not a law that you can't make pumpkin pie whenever the hell you want? Like, that is true. And it's a vegetable. Just, it is. So you yeah. can eat it for breakfast because it's yes. healthy. Yes. Absolutely. Because if you yeah. put whipped cream on it, it's basically a complete meal. Like, yeah, it's got basically all the food groups. It's got dairy. It's there's, got yeah, there's eggs vegetables. in it. There's protein. It's got eggs. Yeah. It's got milk. Like, yeah, it's nature's most complete food. It really is. I hope the pumpkin board is listening. Maybe they want to sponsor us. There you yeah. Go. Is pumpkin there a pumpkin growers, board? You know what's There probably is. Yeah, I'm sure there is. Um, other than that, not much. Just getting ready for Christmas and the girl child's birthday is on the day this comes out actually so Oof. she'll be six and is the party happening before her birthday or after it's happening the day before oh thank goodness then you don't have to wait I, now is it happening early in the day because that used to be over lunchtime okay that's which pretty I good intentionally because i figured i can like i'm gonna do a uh, a unicorn themed snack board with you know star-shaped cheese and little sandwiches and uh, you can color powdered sugar with food coloring which I didn't know so I'm going to make puppy chow which is healthy because it has peanut butter and cereal in it and mm-hmm, so it's a whole sure. grain right yeah, yeah so it's, it's healthy I mean on the one hand I don't really give a shit because a it's a special event and b they're not my kids not all of them um but also I know what my kids are like if I crank them full of sugar and no protein and no not no crazy like sugar makes them hyper kind of way but in a if you spike their blood sugar and then their blood sugar tanks that doesn't do anybody any good sure yeah Um, so i spent an obscene amount of money on unicorn themed party supplies and this better be the most magical fucking birthday this kid has ever had Um, (laughs) and maybe she'll still be into unicorns next year and you can yeah pull them all out again i mean in in all of our defense, this is the first friend birthday we've been able to have because of COVID. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we've got a couple couple years to make up for. Um, yeah. And I'll let you know how it goes, but I did hire our normal babysitter to come and help mm-hmm. with the party, which I think is a real stroke of genius. I'm feeling yes. very good about yeah, that. Yeah, that's but definitely a good idea. We did that for very many years, and it was a huge yeah. help. Yeah. Because um, they love her, and she loves them. And I mean, obviously... I love them, but they're loud, and there's a lot of them, so yeah. it's nice to have an extra set of hands. Yeah, for um, sure, and if you're, yeah, putting out food or helping out someone else's kid or any of those types of things, it's always good to have 
extra adults around that you can tell what to do, right? Yeah. I mean, you exactly. might have parents stick around, but you don't know for sure. Some people drop off. Some people stick around. You, that's uh, yeah. kind of a toss-up sometimes. Well, and um, because my kids are so close in age, a lot of the boy child's friends are coming as well because it's pretty common around here that there are siblings who are quite close in age. Um, and it seems really rude to be like, one of your kids can come the other one cannot come play with their friends mm -hmm. you know, because the kids are all about the same age. They're all friends. Yeah. Um, so we ended up with some extra kids that way too. And I just, you know, plus the babysitter's cool. She's not a mom. You know, she's you know, like 19. She's fun, you know, and she can tell them they can do whatever the hell they want. And it's not like I'm being that mom who's just like, do whatever. I don't care. Yeah. You know, even now, do knows, um, do <laughs> barn tours end up part of birthday parties at your place? Or I guess you don't know yet, but uh, is that I on the on the schedule? Kind of doubt it with kids this age, and it's very cold out, um, so I'd be kind of surprised. For the boy child's birthday, I think it will because there's tractors. But mm -hmm. for the girl child, I think with um, unicorns and snacks and it being freaking cold out i think they'll probably stay in the house that's an interesting yeah. question i hadn't even considered it um so what's happening at your place arlene well we don't have thanksgiving well i mean we already had thanksgiving back in october so it wasn't technically a long weekend for us but then it kind of turned into one because our school had a professional development day for teachers so that means meant the kids didn't go to school on friday so what would have been your Black Friday, which in Canada ends up being kind of Black Friday. People don't have the day off, but they put a bunch of stuff on sale because Americans do. I don't know. It's one of those weird hybrid Canadian things. So because we had an extra day off, um, my daughter and I had decided that we would go on a road trip. So we actually crossed the border for the first time in several years. Um, the restrictions were gone and we knew that wait times wouldn't be as long as they were before you didn't have to do any special paperwork or anything so we went down to Syracuse which is just under three hours away from us here in eastern Ontario so yeah went down to New York State and started looking for a prom dress so we actually stayed over two nights drove down on Friday afternoon I'd milked in the morning then took a bit of a nap because I wanted to make sure that I was good to go for a longer drive um, yes, yeah, so I had a couple appointments booked on Saturday to look at dresses and actually picked and bought one by the end of that day and then also went to the giant mall in Syracuse and looked around. We went to two different Targets. Do you know the story of Canadian Target, Katie? I heard that it was a thing and then it stopped being a thing. Yes. So Did they Canadians just not love cute shit or like what's... What's so the problem up there? we had we had a store called Zellers and it was like a discount chain. It was it was fine. Anyway, it it had been around for a long time and they went out of business. So they closed and then we'd never had Target. It had just never come to Canada. So Target ended up taking on a bunch of those Zellers locations and they did a big expansion across Canada kind of all in one fell swoop you know like they put it I don't know how many how many hundreds of locations all kind of within a very short amount of time um, but due to supply issues and the way they had to purchase products and stuff it was not as good as the American Target it was still pretty good I mean it was nice but it was more expensive than the stores that they had replaced and it was new for a lot of people because if people didn't do cross-border shopping, they didn't know about Target. And so I think they just kind of got ahead of themselves in terms of like expanding really fast. And then the market didn't, didn't quite work out the way they thought. So it was here for a short time and then it went bankrupt. So then they all closed again. So we actually had a Target like five minutes from my house for about two years. And it was amazing. And then it disappeared. And is there Walmart in Canada or not? Yes, yeah. So we've had Walmart okay. for quite a while, yeah. Okay. What can you tell me about, is it Canadian Tire, which is apparently yes. not an auto parts store? Or well, it has auto, auto parts. Auto parts store? Yes. So Canadian Tire would be maybe kind of 
would be a competition for Target, I would say, because it has a little bit of food, but not like grocery items. Um, especially on Christmas, there's lots in terms of toys and games. It's all your garden stuff. In the summer, there is like a garden center, plus there's all like your shovels and rakes and all that kind of stuff. That's where you would go for your Christmas lights. It's also where you go for your, your sports equipment, especially in small towns, like your hockey sticks, skates, helmets, all that kind of stuff. You can get your things. Camping supplies is all at Canadian Tire and kitchen stuff and pet stuff. And then lighting. Yeah, it's kind of like hardware, but also homeware. So, so it, it sounds like maybe it's more like um, Fleet Farmer, like Menards is here. That it's like... Maybe? A little bit home improvement, but also some groceries and also pet stuff and also... Yeah, so we have like... Clothing we had like random other shit. Yes, yeah, they, yeah, there is clothing in terms of more so like outdoor wear and sports wear so like yeah boots coats those types of things but not too much more you can get your hunting stuff there hunting fishing all those types of things yeah yeah i guess when i i was in some facebook group where somebody mentioned canadian tire and to me that would be like an auto parts store like Mm -hmm. auto parts and they were like yeah i'm gonna go buy a vacuum cleaner and some kitchen stuff and i was like yeah all right yeah, they've okay. actually got some really nice Christmas lines, too. So this time of year, they've yeah. got, yeah, all your Christmas decorations, like indoor and outdoor stuff. How your inflatables. Christmas shopping do you have done? Um, I would say after this weekend, there weren't a lot of deals in the States. The exchange rate is not great right now. But there is a lot of stuff that we can't get here. Or you have to pay a lot to ship it. So it was worth going down in terms of finding some things that I knew would be more difficult to get in Canada. Um so I've made some progress. It is always hard to figure out at this point how much I've bought for the, the remaining birthdays and what's actually going to be for Christmas. So I do need to do an inventory. But in terms of like the extended family, kind of like the name draws that we've done, grandparents, that kind of stuff, definitely making progress. I have to say I got the steal of a lifetime yesterday and I feel so good about it. The The girl child, both kids love Gabby cats. It's a... Uh, Gabby's Dollhouse on Netflix mm-hmm. for folks with younger kids. It's um, actually a really cute show. It's about a girl who's got a dollhouse that she can like go inside of and pretend and you know whatever. Yeah, it's cute. every kid's dream. That's what you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when well, I played with dollhouses, that's what I was thinking of, right? The girl child's obsessed. I mean, the whole place is populated with little cats. It's cute. There's lots of music. It's fun. Whatever. Um, Walmart yesterday had. She got. A Gabby's dollhouse that was supposed to be for her birthday, and unfortunately, the boy child accidentally told her about it. So that got out early. Um, but she's been playing with it quite obsessively, and I saw there's, you know, a number of like add on pieces. And I was walking around looking for a birthday gift for her little friend whose birthday is tomorrow, and saw a Gabby's dollhouse tag that was marked down to $4. And I was like, well, now what is this? And there wasn't anything on the shelf. I was like, well, that's right, yeah. It's probably gone. And I look around, and there is one, like, on the top shelf, like, way back in there. And it was an accessory piece that had been close to $40, was marked down to 4 bucks. Sweet. And I was showing it to Jim on my phone when I got home, because I hadn't brought it in the house. And the girl child saw it and starts yelling, I want that for my birthday. Please, Mommy, please, can I have that? That's the only thing I want. And I was like... Maybe. (laughs) I don't know where you might find that thing. We'll tell the birthday fairy. Uh, Yeah. And I never thought we'd be that family, but we're doing Elf on the Shelf. Um, Mm -hmm. Except I didn't, I am not leaning hard into the whole, she's spying on you and going to tell Santa and rat you out. Because that seems, I mean, the the whole idea of Santa, like, spying on kids is creepy. Um, Santa, like having a little a little snitch in your home all month is creepier to me <laughs> yeah but the girl child, just ramp that ramp that uh, yeah. fairy tale all the way up she's exactly the right age for this magic yeah and she is so hard into it she made our elf a little crown she's made her a little book no oh, that's cute it's a whole thing uh there's yeah. pictures on the instagram if folks want to see it's 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. It, as much as a lot of it is more work for us when they're really into it and so excited about it, it does make it more fun most of the time except those mornings when you wake up and realize that you forgot to move it yeah well it's the the upside of the insomnia again (laughs) anyway so yeah there you go (laughs) and uh i will say i'm not putting much effort into setting up scenes like this morning the elf was riding one of the girl child's little toys around it's yeah yeah that's easy enough yeah yeah just position it somewhere new yeah she was plenty excited about that so do we have anything else to talk about earlier? I don't think so. We will go ahead and lead into our guest for this week. All right. Today we're joined by Allison Weaver from Alberta, Canada. And Allison, we start each of our interviews with the same question, and this is a way to introduce yourself to our listeners. So we ask, what are you growing? And for our farm guests, that can cover crops and livestock, but it also covers families, businesses, and lots of other stuff. So Allison, what are you growing? Well, good morning, ladies. Right now, I'm not growing a whole heck of a lot. It's uh, minus 36 in Lloydminster, Alberta, and we're covered in snow. But as a rule, what we grow on our farm is we grow canola, uh, three different types of wheat, barley. When we feel brave, we sow some peas. Uh, We have a small livestock herd. My husband and I have grown four children on our farm, and we're excited to support our daughter and husband as they now are uh, nurturing and growing three grandchildren, three of their children, our grandchildren, on the farm. And for fun, I grow horses, and I have a collection of dogs. For our uh, non-Celsius listeners, negative 36 degrees Celsius is negative 33 degrees Fahrenheit, which is much worse than I thought it was going to be. So... (laughs) I guess for the Americans in the audience, because we're like <clears throat> the only ones who don't use. Everybody else does it. <laughs> so since, we, since we've got farmers in the listening crowd, what kind of cows are we talking about? Uh, I started out with a small herd of speckled parks, which was a breed that was developed right here uh, in the region that uh, we live. And then we also, we crossbreed them with Angus. So we have a commercial herd, a small commercial herd of speckles crossed with black Angus, I should say, but my daughter has three, four very large Gelvy Semital cross cows who think they're the queen of the fields, and they're big, but she gets beautiful calves out of them, and uh, I quite enjoy seeing those big gals out there. And since I know that people love to talk about their grandkids, how old are they? Oh, well, they are five, three, and two from the same parents so sometimes my daughter needs a mental health break and her husband actually the two of them do Uh, yeah ben and three little boys ben mason and charlie and yeah that's quite the little squad yeah that's a good way to describe them arlene is a squad and how many horses for the horse people in the oh uh at the moment we have 11 horses uh Our farm is a lovely place for horses to live because you get to grow old here and have a wonderful life. My husband says they live a better life than him. They have a monthly massage appointment. They get pedicures. They get all sorts of great things the horses do. Um, But out of that crew of horses, some are definitely in their geriatric years. So we just enjoy having them. But we do have five riding horses Um, And we do everything from moving cows to dressage with them. And I've decided my next goal for riding is I'm going to learn how to do uh, working equitation. And I'm quite excited about that. Uh, You get to carry a... Okay, I need more details because I'm not a horse. Oh, working equitation. (laughs) I don't even know what that means. It's, it's, you you gotta go through a whole bunch of obstacles and you have to carry this great big pole with you and it comes from the spanish from spain and the spaniards did it and i think it originally came from bullfighting is where it came from and you got to carry this pole and you got to put a pole in a barrel and the pole i think is 12 14 feet long or something so i have a young horse that i absolutely love and so her and i she doesn't know it yet but this is what her and i are going to learn next so is it sort of like uh Pony Club Gymkhana for, for grown-ups. Is that what I'm hearing? That's what I... But also I, with a 14-foot long pole. pole yes. Yeah. I can see not wanting little kids doing that. No, that no. And eventually... Horrifying accidents exactly. waiting to happen. Yeah, but it is. It's like... Um, so, Allison, as, as a grown-up 
who deals with small children and horses, how do I convince my husband to let us have a horse? And by us, I mean ostensibly for the kids and realistically for me. When's his most busiest time of the year? I probably shouldn't ask this when he's like, I'm going to listen to the show. Oh, probably no. Probably tipping my hand here. New horses arrive at our farm usually during seeding or harvest time because I can sneak out quickly, get the horse, bring it in. My husband does not even notice it, usually till Christmas time. And uh, we just bring them in. I tend to buy horses all the same color. So then nobody really knows if it's a new horse or not. Um, except we have a young girl who rides out here and they bought a horse that does not match the rest of the herd. So it's standing out like a, a sore thumb right now. But uh, that's my goal, Katie, is I buy horses the same color and I bring them in in the night when nobody notices them coming. <laughs> But the one that's a different color is hers, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you can't, yeah, I mean, that one's, maybe you're getting rent or something. So, I yeah. mean, that, that one's the real money maker in the, <laughs> in the group. Yeah. I guess otherwise, maybe you could split them between pastures and just pretend that you've moved them. Exactly. You know, because it's harder to get a total if they're all in different places. That's right. And I, you know, when people always ask together. me how many horses I have, I go, well, I think a little bit. I count, oh, I have a couple in this pasture and I got a couple over here and... And it's a moving target. Yeah. Well, you can always get real philosophical, too, and say, well, what does ownership really mean? Exactly. Do I really own them? Yeah. And you know, and, and then if you seem vague enough and, like, you might talk long enough, people will leave you alone. Yes. And, you know. I mean, um, that's basically my life, like. Exactly. Plan. So that's working and out pretty well. Our daughter doesn't live in the yard anymore, but her horses are here. So they're not really all of my horses because she has quite a fair collection herself. So out of the 11, I don't own all of them is what I use. But on the other side of that, the more serious side of it, um, many, many years ago when our daughter was about three or four and had a very, already her horse passion for horses was, was there. And we read God's sakes, the phone just keeps ringing. So anyway, so then um, we had a great, uh, read an amazing article on why girls should have pets to nurture. And it was a really amazing article to talk, um, gir girls, it's better if they have a pony than a boyfriend. Because that pony will fulfill the need to, to take care of something, to nourish. And as they go into their teenage years, it's so important to have those things for your daughters. And uh, so they're not maybe looking for love in the wrong places. And so my husband, whenever it came to Amanda would like to try this on the horse, Amanda would really like a kitty, we should probably get a new puppy. He said, if that keeps the boys away, have as many horses as you like. I tell you, I think too. You could you could have a lot of ponies for what bail money or unexpected, you know, teen motherhood would set you back. Or ammunition so. when your husband's shooting at the guy who he doesn't want to come visit your son or your daughter. So there you go. Arlene, maybe you better buy your daughter another cow. <clears throat> I know she already has a boyfriend, but you know, oh yeah, she'll have oh, less time I mean, to cause problems. The, the heifer that we did buy her is is due in March, so. So we'll wait and see. There you go. Well, then she'll need to do some I was looking at the Jersey cows at Agribition. They had them on display for lovely Jersey cows. That's what I grew up milking was two Jersey cows named Fawn and Dawn. And uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I quite enjoy the Jersey cows. Yes, yeah, we have a single one right now, but we'll see what happens in March. We might have two. So I love that Arlene wrote this in here for me. Um, I am a big fan of planners because I really like the, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The illusion of control over my life. Um, and so you've created a planner called Navigate, which is intended for ag folks. What's unique about your planner and can you describe some of the elements of it for us? Well, you know, the uni unique thing of the planner is I've, I've tried really hard to create it so that it works in everybody's life. Some people like to just look at the month at a glance. Other people want to break down their week. And then we have the people, maybe like myself, who like to break it down by the day and make those plans. But when making it, I wanted it to be a 
but it also I want it to be a tool. So just like our um, drills that are a battery pack and we don't have to plug them in, I wanted the planner to be this tool that would help us um, kind of clear some of the chaos out of our life, put our thoughts down so they're not totally rummaging around in our brain all the time and using up excess space and energy that as anybody raising kids on a farm, not raising kids, the more we can save our energy to do the more important things, I think the better. The other thing that I really wanted to push out about the planner though, is to do some reflection on how last year went and give yourself gratitude for however it went. The other thing I wanted to really push out though is priorities and Arlene's heard me talk about priorities before. And I wanted to um, tell people that your to-do list is not your priority list. So two priorities a day is what I was, what, what I really want to push people to take that pressure off themselves. And then the other idea of the planner was, let's put it all together in one book. So you've got the records there, you have um, all the egg records in the back from your gardening map to what to have in your pantry. If you're terrified to go grocery shopping, the stuff's there to help you out. So I wanted a book all in one. Put all your post-it notes in one spot. Put all your, whatever you need in one spot so you're not got five books sitting on your desk and you're only writing in none of them. I feel really judged right now. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Because um, <laughs> there's uh, four planners and like 12 post-it notes on my desk at this moment. Um, and I still have no idea what the hell's going on. But she can't see that. Uh, I can't see that. No, but she's obviously <laughs> been listening to our show if she knew <laughs> how many planners were likely to be on my desk being unused. Oh, and there's two under my desk, but those aren't all from this year. So, um, Allison, have you always been interested in planning and productivity and efficiency? Or I have. Did you used to be one of us? Um, I hate to say it, but I wasn't one of you. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, I asked my mom this, actually, when I started the idea of creating the planner, and she said, from the time you could write, you've carried a notebook around to organize yourself. She said, you were the girl who, before school, the night before school, you had your clothes laid out so you knew what to wear. It didn't mean my bedroom didn't get messy. I was every bit of a typical teenager, but I had a bed with drawers under it, and my mom and dad said I could store more crap in those drawers than anybody to make my room look neat. So... Uh, but I did. I've always liked to have my to-do lists. Uh, I'm a person who checks off her to-do list. And I hate to say it, I'm also the person who will write something on my to-do list if I've already done it and check it off. Um, well, that's just satisfying. I mean, if you don't do that, then yeah, <laughs> why have exactly. a to-do list? Exactly. It is. I like to think of that as being a, a life hack. That some days you put really, really basic shit on your to-do mm. list because it feels good to cross mm -hmm. it off. And you know what? It's not like there's to-do list police that are going to come around and be like, oh. you had already done that. Yeah. You can't yeah, write it that, down. That wasn't a big enough task to put on exactly. the list. I mean, yeah. To hell with you. It? It's my list. Exactly. Like. Exactly. It's your list. And and you need to do with it. And, and it hopefully, I hope it helps you support you to live the life you want to live too. Not the life that you think other people want you to live, but the life that you want to live. So, Allison, can you give us and uh, sorry yeah our listeners too um some tips on being more productive that the time with the time that we do have i know sometimes it feels like i'm working really hard and yet nothing ever really gets finished or you don't feel that sense of accomplishment yes um i really suggest to people to pick your priorities uh actually for each day and be kind to yourself when you pick your priorities uh like if for some reason you're planning to say do a huge walking trek somewhere you know you've got to build your priorities to build up to that but other thing is if you're on survival mode if you are a mom with young children if you're a mom with teenage children if you're not a mom and you're just trying to keep the farm going or your business going Pick two, like I said, two priorities a day. And I've shared this in workshops and I have women go, how can you only do two priorities in a day? And I said, and this is, I said to them, well, and we practice it. So for me, and I always share this, the podcast today was my number one priority. 
So um, the podcast is going to happen over our lunch time here in Western Canada. So I made sure that there's some lunch ready upstairs. Uh, doors are closed. I forgot to unplug the phone. So my so my priority is the podcast. My to do list is to do A, B, C, and D so that I can sit here relaxed, enjoy my my visit and my conversation with with you two wonderful women, and not feel any stress. And actually, my mind is not even thinking about. Uh, anything else that I think I might need to do. And then I've made a priority this afternoon. Our farrier is coming. So after lunch, to be kind to our farrier, I got to go bring in the horses, put them in the barn so their feet can warm up. And that's my other priority today. Um, and I, I've worked really hard to get there to those two priorities. And when we're in the busy harvest mode, seeding mode, uh, there actually maybe is not any priorities for some of those days because we go into what we, you know, into your harvest routine, your harvest habit uh, that you get into. And as we know, in the busy season on any farm, you get the call, the combine's on fire. Well, guess what the priority is right there? Those priorities change. Like you're, you're on it and you're going. And I don't know about your guys' farm, but things the plan when we all walk out the door at 7 30 8 o'clock in the morning can by 8 30 in the morning the whole plan can change because either it's rained or holy crap the weed is ready to go and we don't have the bins ready and there's you know things happen doesn't matter if you farm for 40 years you you're not always ready so in the busy times so you're saying the number one tip is that anything that is actively legitimately on fire is top priority i would put it and as top priority katie things yeah. that are not actively on fire yeah. are below that yeah exactly is that, yeah is that correct I, I like that i'm gonna write that in my book for harvest time next for next year if you're actively on fire you're my number one priority like that you just put it right in the front of the yeah, planner right, right on the cover right on the cover i i might oh you wait to see what 2024 brings there might be something that reflects that uh yeah. i'm waiting for the special barnyard language edition of this planner oh. it's just gonna say step one put out things that are literally fire. on fire step two say fuck it to everything else <laughs> step three eat snacks katie's to-do list done oh there you go I, I have to say, Allison, as someone who does, um, I tend to write to-do lists in that pretty compulsively just to to get them out of my head and Good. help with the anxiety some. Good. And giving myself permission to prioritize sleep over basically anything except stuff that is literally on fire has been the A-plus number one thing. If I'm not taking my medication and sleeping... Nothing else is going to happen. It doesn't matter how many lists I make or how well I organize or how well I prioritize or whatever else, you know. And it's critical that we give ourselves permission. And I hate that we have to give ourselves permission to not die. But we do. You know. We do. And and you know what, Katie, I think you, you hit it on the head right there. The nail on the head right there with that by saying, I hate that we have to give ourselves permission but you know what we do? We have to give ourselves permission. I have a friend who started a new business and she took a uh, screenshot of her planner for the month of March, so March 2022. Her f and, and when you look in the planner on the month, it has what's your focus. Her focus was Kathy will sleep. And she gave herself- Kathy has her priorities straight. For the month of March, she gave herself the permission that I need to, I need to regenerate, I need to sleep. I just need to relax. And we know when we start anything new, uh, you know, there's all that pressure that will come with that. But the moment we physically write it down, we've already given ourselves the permission then. So if Katie's priority, if you have that every day, sleep, well, I say thank you for doing that, Katie, because that is your number one priority. I have put down for this Saturday, my priority is to embrace myself in the Christmas season because I love Christmas. So the Christmas decorations are coming out. I'm gonna make ginger snaps and I'm just, I'm just gonna enjoy it. And uh, it's gonna be minus 35 again probably. So it's a great time for that, but uh, it is. And I'm gonna write it in my book because I'm 
I'm as bad as anybody. Someone will call me. Allison, could you help us with this today? And I look in my book, and then I say, no, I've wrote this down. I said, sorry, today, I cannot come help you today. Today is actually all about Allison. I know it's sort of a, a continuing theme on this show, but this movement towards calling it self-care to prioritize showering or sleeping or anything for ourselves is bullshit. You know, I, I heard somebody refer to it as self-maintenance, which I think makes a lot more sense because you don't call, you know, changing the oil in your car to be a, a benefit little perk that you do to, you know, to treat it nice. It's something you do because it keeps things running and sleeping and eating and showering and putting up your damn Christmas decorations all fall under that category of yes. things you do because you're a human and you deserve it, not because it's some special, yes. special treat. Exactly. And you know, I, um, and I do say sometimes there are things that should be your routine or your habit. So you, in my world, if you're a person who needs to make your bed every day, you do not need to write that down. I don't put having sleep in there as the same category as making your bed and putting in the first load of laundry or whatever your morning routine will be, your day routine. Because as we read more and know more, if you're trying to keep anxiety at bay or just try trying to keep a even plane sleep drink water and some physical exercise those are the three things we we need to have and if those are three things you're struggling with by all means get it written down and that gives you the permission to do those things and I just feel in this world right now just give yourself permission to do whatever you need to do um Allison, the, the thing that really drove it home for me was the amount of research that's coming out about how sleep deprivation compares to driving drunk or other things of that nature. Yes. Um, just realizing the, the literal physical toll, that it's not just, oh, I don't feel great if I don't sleep. It really seriously impacts your ability to function. It does. And, you know, and this harvest, we I kept a pretty close eye on... Um, on everybody because uh, we had a lovely harvest where we could go and go and go and go but because you could go and go and go and go we got tired and my nephew who was part of our harvest crew has an, uh, a new him and his wife have a year old baby and there were maybe nights where she didn't want to sleep and and dad was a little tired so we took note of that saying okay you know what guys we're we're going to be done at 11 o'clock tonight so everybody can get a good night's sleep and and don't anybody else show up here till nine in the morning and i know for some farmers that would maybe cause them a lot of stress to not you know go till two o'clock in the morning but we all have to take care of ourselves because we only have this crew to do our harvest. We don't have a big crew who can come in and take over. So that sleep, we're handling big equipment. We need the sleep. We need the rest. As the parent of young children, I really want to thank you for enabling people to take that rest too, because I know, especially it seems like when it comes to fathers and sons, it can be very, very difficult for one to say to the other, either either direction, that they need that rest. And nothing good happens when people get that tired. So, yeah. No. And like you said, when we have those stretches of, of decent weather, I mean, if you can look in the forecast and say, you know what, the next couple of days look like we're going to be able to make a lot of progress. Oh. Why, kill you, why kill yourself today when you know that you've got three or four days? You know, weather forecasting is pretty good that we could hopefully be able to look ahead and say, you know what, if we stagger ourselves a little bit, take some time to sleep tonight, this is gonna get done. Exactly. And it, we don't have to race the neighbors or race ourselves <laughs> or get the best, you know, the best record we've ever had in terms of time and and risk our risk our health and our lives to do it. It doesn't That's sense. right, Arlene, totally. You know, and I mean, we stop also for supper and I know a lot mm -hmm. of families are going away from that, cause they, but it's something I hope we never go away from. First of all, I just love it when we can all check in with each other. Everybody gets out of that combine and has a stretch. And I mean, our combining crew is from the age of uh, 20, late 20s up to an 80, our uncle who's an 80 year old. So 
we've got a wide gamut of ages and and you know what we have fun at our family supper and we don't stop for an hour it's not like we're stopping you know and having a party but it's just really great to get out and stretch those legs and enjoy the f the food that has been created for them yeah that's a valid point too even to yeah and then you someone gets the dishes back at the end of the meal yeah. <laughs> it makes it makes it easier on the person who probably uh, provided the food too that then you're not uh, going through equipment later it's, oh later on looking totally for stuff. oh i say if you don't bring back a dish you don't get to eat tomorrow i'm pretty strict on that yeah well and you know breaking bread together uh is so important because as soon as we take that moment and uh, it might sound a little weird, but take that moment and we just, our jaw relaxes the moment we start eating our food. It relaxes our, you know, on your head, across your forehead. And then it also gives everybody time maybe to ask some questions. Simple as my combine setting doesn't seem to be working as well. Or, you know, because then you've relaxed a little bit and you're thinking about how things are going. But I truly believe in anything we do in life, it is so important to sit down, share some nourishment together because it nourishes your physical being, but it also nourishes your mental being. So Allison, I had the privilege of meeting you and hearing you speak at an event here in Ontario a while ago. And one of the things you talked about there was writing a personal vision statement and defining your core values. Now, when you talk about eating together, that seems to kind of reflect some of some of your feelings on that, but can you tell us a bit about this process and why you think it's important to have a personal personal vision statement? Yes. I think we all need our personal vision statement because it keeps us accountable for when people or ourselves think that we need to try something new or we need to change things. So when we create our, find our core values and mine are family, community, and connection. And from there, we take our core values and use it to help us create our vision. So then when something new comes to us, we can be, we can use that as our check-in. Is this part of my core values? Uh, is this new opportunity to me? Does it, does it cover things, my family, my community? my connection. And as I tell everybody, Arlene and Katie, you're now part of my family because we've connected, we've built community, and we're family. And then does it check in with my personal my personal vision statement? You know, my vision statement is to to share stories, to give strength to other people in in I I used to say in the world of agriculture, but I said in the world to know that they too can do whatever they want as long as you're supporting your core values that you want to live. And it's just so important. I was just talking to a, a young woman about this the other day. She wants to do this, this, and this. And I said, does it check in with your core values? Is this your core values? And she looked at me and she said, I don't even know what my core values are. And I said, before you venture off into another new business, take the time to figure out your core values so that you know where you're going and I wish in my late 20s early 30s I would have known that because when I was 30 it was probably the roughest year of my life um, because I I wasn't really sure what my vision was and what I should do and I was hard on myself I was farming with my husband we were raising our children but did I really have a career because I didn't give myself permission that what I was doing was my career at that time because I truly don't think I had my values in, I don't think I knew what my values were. So that is why I think it's so important for us to have those core values at all age. And this isn't something, if you're 80, you shouldn't have. I think we should always have our core values uh, at all times of our life. I think that's really helpful too, like you talked earlier about setting your priorities. Mm -hmm. Right. Where where if there are those days where you have that request or someone asks for your help with something and there's, you know, there's a question there, whether what is the priority? If you can reflect then back to what have I said my priorities are, yes. then you can you can make some decisions and hopefully not feel guilty it, about it. I mean, we all feel guilty about <clears throat> lots of stuff, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Right. We can, we're allowed to say no. As hard exactly, as Arlene. And that's what I really hope by. 
uh, me supporting people to find their core values and their vision is that they don't carry that guilt. Uh, and you know, I do, uh, I share stories of the farm and it's called the marathon called life, uh, leaving, you know, how to manage it all and leaving the guilt behind because we do, we need to leave the guilt behind. We all live our own lives and whatever works best for me. I am still a highly busy people, busy person. I get a hard time for that sometimes, but that's who I am. And, and I really like that. And that's where it comes under my core value of connection and, I live for that. I love connection. I think that's important for us to remember too. You know, like you said, you, you thrive on connection and that's one of your core values for people who are more introverted. That doesn't have to be your priority. No. And that doesn't mean that Allison is doing it better. No. And like you said, it, it, you know, it's just what, what your priorities want to, what you want your priorities to be and what, what fills your soul and what, what drives you yes. are going to be different for everybody. And that doesn't have to mean that one person's doing it better than somebody yes. else. Yes. And when you're creating that vision statement, uh, it's okay that it evolves too. It, Cause you know, it's not something easy to do because you got to dig deep into yourself. And, and I have a, like a six step process of how to go through that. And, you know, it takes time to do that. Like if you were in the workplace, you wouldn't sit down one afternoon and just have that vision statement done up. So same with your personal life. So I, I've given permission to a lot of people to say, it's okay if it takes you a year to correct your vision or to create your vision statement. Well, the looks on some of their faces, who's got a year? And I said, you do, you do take a year to create your vision. Uh, Cause that'll give you a chance to see where the curve balls or how the balls get thrown at you and where you want it and where you are at that time of your life. Cause we're all at different points of our life too. I think Allison, one thing that gets missed too is how much stress it can relieve to have your priorities laid out so clearly. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I went to a, a farmer retreat several years ago and talked about, you know, what is the very highest priority for us? And for us, it was to keep our family together. Ah. So keeping the farmland in the family <clears throat> does not, for us, come above keeping the family together. Mm. And so then, you know, the second priority is keeping the farmland owned by the family. The third highest priority is keeping the farm operation in the family. Yeah. And, you know, so on from there. And that took so much stress off because, you know, keeping X number of cattle is so far down the list at that point right. that it loses so much of the, the stress around it. And for myself, I know with, with priority setting and goal setting and that, I feel like if I approach it straight on to, you know, set some serious goals... Mm serious mm -hmm. things my brain just nope mm -hmm. done um but you know if i if i set a priority like didn't get smallpox this year <laughs> you know pretty easy <laughs> you know house didn't get taken over by rabid raccoons pretty easy <laughs> you know and from there i can kind of set like increasingly realistic goals and okay. visions and statements and things you know, okay. you know because it's hard to be serious it is. about this stuff. And you know, but Katie, I appreciate how you broke that up. So really, you guys did some life priorities. And life priorities are so different than our daily priorities. But hopefully then, your daily priorities uh, support and lift up those life priorities that you've created. And as as farmers, it's so important that we create those the life priorities and have those conversations with our families. Well, and for us, it was such a big thing to have that conversation about what if our kids don't want to take over the mm -hmm. farm when they were babies instead of when they're, you mm -hmm. know, 25 and we're pushing 70 and nobody wants to take over, yes. you know, and if that happens, that happens fine. But it felt so relieving in my own brain to have that conversation uh, yes you know because so many folks i think you know we don't know what to 
what to do so we just won't talk about it and then it won't exactly. happen exactly yes you know? yeah no it's interestingly not how it works no, no it doesn't work so. that way does it yeah so another topic that you're really passionate about is resilience which seems to be a a buzz is it ever you know i'm sure if you i was just if you put it in pinterest it's probably right up yeah. there if, see i thought uh, i was so creative if, you know about a year ago when I was creating my resilience with a plan and now it's, maybe I'll take credit for creating it to be a buzzword. Uh, no ego on my end here, girls. So um, okay. resilience is very important to me and um, why resilience is important uh, is that, well, in farming, in agriculture, you really have to learn how to be resilient because unfortunately we can do all the best we can and then mother nature depending on what mood she is in she can change it within 10 seconds of what's going on so but I think to be resilient and I've done more reading on this lately and I'm a big fan of Brene Brown and she's done a lot of research on resilience but after all my reading and everything I've done I think the number one most important thing you need to be resilient is you need to love yourself first. That doesn't mean you're egotistical. It doesn't mean you're full of yourself. It means that you truly know yourself. You're going to know how to reach out to find that team you need to support you. You are going to create a team to lift up when it needs to be lifted up. And when you truly love yourself, you glow and you share that with the people around you. And I think that strength is absolutely amazing. How do we support our kids being more resilient? I know it's a, it's a learned skill, but what are some of the kind of the steps to becoming resilient? What are the steps to becoming resilient? Well, you know, I think one of the first things to becoming resi helping your children to become resilient is you need to uh, helicopter less as a parent. And I think the first step is to give your children, set them up to succeed by giving them small tasks. So when they're little, starting with small tasks that they can actually do doesn't mean they did them right, but they can do and they feel really, 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 really good about it. So maybe that right now my grandsons come and help me collect the eggs in, in my chicken house. And I don't care if they drop the eggs. I don't, you know, that's not the point. The point is they're brave enough to go in that chicken house and go get an egg and bring it back out again. And you know, and when we were raising our kids, I tried hard to give them tasks. And I read a book once that said, if your child makes their bed, don't you dare go in there and make it look better. And that was the best set of words and that I'd ever read about parenting. So if your kids, you know, if you get them to do the dishes or if they make the meal, my mo my mother-in-law always shares the story. She was sick in bed and her, my husband and his younger brother, they're just six months apart in age and they were probably five and four. They made her toast and brought it to her in bed. Well, the bread was moldy and I think they might've burnt it. But she smiled, she appreciated it, and she nibbled on that toast, and she never criticized them once that it was burnt or moldy. And I think as parents, we need to get back to, we got to let our kids try it. We got to let them, maybe they're going to fail at it, and then we'll help pick them up. But I think that's how we build resiliency. And, and the joy of raising kids on the farm we need to let them explore without mom and dad following them every single step they make. Uh, we we got we to gotta encourage the children growing up in this world to uh, go and explore and not always be organized uh, 24 hours a day. I'm hearing you. 
That's a hard one for me, but I, uh, I, <laughs> I hear you. Uh, and you know, yeah. it's harder now, Arlene, than even when we raised our kids, because there's all this, like the phone and the social media, and they're they're always they're, everybody's expected to be on all the time, including our kids, but including parents raising their kids. You're expected to be on all the time. Like this is the newest thing happening, or this is this, or this is that, or, you know, I'm. Like, let the kids run around the rink. Let them, yeah, you're going to hover from somewhere to keep an eye where they might be. But let them think they're adventuring. Let your kids believe they're on an adventure right now in their life. And maybe they're going to get a little lost and they got to figure out how to get themselves back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one to remember. I think for, for me, some of that... And I, I try not to be too much of a hoverer, but especially around the farm, that farm safety aspect is is a hard one, right? Where you're like, I want to keep them safe. I know there's so many dangers. And yet I also want them to have fun and have adventures, right? You know, like the, the line between not getting too hurt when you yes. work in a place with large equipment and livestock and all those types of things is... Well, our knowing when knowing when they're ready and when you're ready to let them go is is a Arlene, hard, hard thing to figure out. Sometimes. I worry way more about my grandsons than I ever ever did my own children. When they bounce, when our grandsons <laughs> bounce on our trampoline, I'm like, oh my god! And our kids, I don't think I watch them. I said, well, if you hit the ground, let me know, and we'll get you to the hospital, I yeah. guess. But yeah, it is, and it's hard. You're right, and farm safety, and you know, and watching them. But we, it's also teaching your kids that they have to be aware and and pay attention and you don't want anything big to happen but every once in a while I think the odd squished finger teaches kids more than anything yeah yeah that's true so that does lead me into my next question what are some of the things that you value most when it came to raising kids on the farm or or watching your grandsons grow Mm. up on the farm oh Sometimes I get a little emotional when I talk about this. I think it was, um, I feel truly uh, blessed that we could raise our children on the farm. I was raised on a farm and the freedom that I felt by being raised on the farm that you could walk anywhere you wanted to be and you could explore. You could also watch food being grown. Uh, So then when I was fortunate enough to marry my wonderful husband and we were able to raise our children then who could live I call it a true life of freedom living on the farm uh the your boundaries are are endless because you have the opportunity to be one with nature and and watch uh calves being born watching uh plants come out of the ground seeing the birds come back every year uh I mean in the last few years here we've got a mama moose that has decided to kind of live in our backyard so we get to watch her and her calves and I think we forget sometimes in agriculture that we take this for grant and there are people you know living in high rises that would probably give anything to walk on a 10 by 10 piece of grass and most of us have you know, a hundred plus acres to 5,000 acres to 10,000 acres where we can explore and, and see the world. Yeah. So the next question I had is kind of leads out of that, but we'll skip over the nail polish on this one. But this is a question that can sometimes annoy parents of young kids who are in the trenches in the moment, right? Or feeling overwhelmed every day. But if you could give yourself any advice for when your kids were little, other than not paint your nails, <laughs> what would it be? Um, not to take anything too seriously. Not to put so much pressure to look like it's all, all together because it's not all together and it's not going to be all together. So I think that's what I'd give myself permission. And the other thing I'd give myself permission to do is it's okay to take a break as a mom. Uh, It's okay if that break means to go ride your horse or uh, read a book, you know what? And it's even okay to hire a babysitter. If you're the mighty stay-at-home mom, it is absolutely fine to hire a babysitter just so you could go have 
a little bit of a break. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, the, the feeling like you have to justify a break when you're raising kids should not be a thing, right? I mean, what in what other job would you be expected to, to be on call yes. 24 hours a day? Well, maybe farming, I suppose. But even at that, you know, there are, there are times you can walk away from the barn, you can walk away from the tractor. Yes. But if when you're when you've got young kids, you are literally on call 24 seven. So if you need to hire a babysitter to take a nap, or wash your hair, yes. do anything to not have someone crying outside the door while you're having a exactly. shower. Exactly. If that's the gift you need for yourself, and don't call it self care. No. Yeah, like Katie said, self preservation. Yes. If that if that's what you need, that's okay. And you know, as women, you know, when I was raising our kids, uh, you know, it was women hard on women. That was the tough part. Oh, you're not a working mom. <laughs> And I'd look going, yeah, I work every single day. I just chose to do it from home. But, you know, and it was that there was such a definition. Well, you don't know what it's like to be a working mom or to have a babysitter all the time or what to do when your children were sick or and that sort of thing. And, and you know, once in a while uh, I looked at one person and I said, I'll switch you. Because right now, let me tell you, I think it's way easier to drop your kid at the babysitter and go to town but that was, you know, as, and me, but it probably is not either. But it was the life we lived in. A, and as women, we get so hard on each other because we've got to define everything and define the role. And, and, you know, we had to categorize it. Well, you're a stay-at-home mom. You're the working mom. And, and I just, we just shouldn't do that. We should just celebrate what we all do and support each other for what we all do and how we do it. And just because you're the stay-at-home mom doesn't mean you're the mom who has to drive the volleyball team every night to volleyball games either. Or you're, I also say, because you know how it, if you're a farm mom and a stay-at-home mom, of course you have fresh muffins and cookies ready for the school all the time. Or you go down to the co-op, you take them out of their plastic container, put it in your Tupperware and drop it off and nobody knows the difference. Well, and of course exactly. you're always just available to to drop everything to go get cows in or whatever yeah too yeah you know so, um there's a very good reason that i pay for daycare mm -hmm. um, because yeah it's you know if it was that easy daycare would be free yes exactly <laughs> and that yeah. was oh sorry arlene that i was, was just gonna say oh. like you said earlier it it's not a competition about any no, of it <laughs> right no. you know we we all we all have to make different decisions for what works for us and our families and yeah you don't have to justify yourself but you also don't need to tear other people down because they're doing it no. different than you they're not judging you because they're doing it differently no well ho hopefully, hopefully they're, they're not, not. <laughs> yeah hopefully they're not those of us on this podcast today are definitely not judging you for any of your choices so just do what you need to do all right so Allison, we ask all of our guests, if you were going to dominate a category at the county fair, what would it be? And categories can be real or made up to ensure that you win. Oh, I know. I've been thinking about the whole categories at the fair. Uh, but I love making salsa. And I have several recipes. And so I decided I am going to dominate the salsa making category at the fair. I like it. I think that's a new one. Are you going to, are you going to enter multiple salsas and see which one the judge? I likes am. Best? That's what I was thinking because I, I yeah, yeah, that's I like plan. trying out a few different kind of recipes, and uh, so not just tomato salsa, but maybe a little bit of mango salsa and some mango black bean salsa, and so yeah, I thought I'd enter quite a few categories to see how that would go. But I thought yeah, salsa category at the fair is what I'm going to go after delicious I Allison love it. I had one other question too how do you bribe your farrier not to tell your husband how many horses there are we have a deal he doesn't tell his wife how many horses he has and um, then that way he doesn't tell we just keep that a secret between all of us because him and I, I may like deal back and forth with horses like my gotcha. latest horse I bought I just bought it from my farrier so yeah I think that it's like the uh, doctor-patient confidentiality. Totally. 
barrier totally. to confidentiality. Yes. Good to know. That, that's a good plan. All right, we'll move into our cussing and discussing segment. We've registered for an online platform called SpeakPipe where you can leave your cussing and discussing entries for us and we'll play them on the show. So go to speakpipe.com backslash barnyard language and leave us a voice memo or you can always send us an email at barnyardlanguage at gmail.com and we will read it out for you. Katie, what are you going to cuss and discuss this week? So I was having coffee with some friends earlier this week and <coughs> one of my friends mentioned this, so thank you, Rachel, I'm stealing it. Um, the fact that her husband can put jeans on his Christmas list and because men's clothing actually goes by <laughs> sizes, he gets pants that fit. That makes sense in the world? Yes. Sizes based on yes, math? Yes, on real numbers that have uh, some correlation with anything else in the universe. The actual size of the clothes that result yeah, from the numbers. That yeah. He can just yeah. write them on a list and someone can just go, oh, this number here is this thing. And I was thinking about it even with shoes. That men's shoes, if you buy, you know, X size, are, I mean, like, maybe they'll fit a little differently, but definitely not the way women's shoes do. <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah. Uncool. Yeah. Wim yeah, women's clothing is oh. just a, an imaginary fairyland <laughs> that the, the numbers oh. mean nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's... Like you might as well just use letters or something because it doesn't make any sense anyway. No. None. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, so Allison, what do you have to cuss and discuss this week? Ratchet straps. I hate ratchet straps. And I don't even like using the word hate. But uh, we use a lot of ratchet straps on our farm. And my husband lives for ratchet straps. And I'm quite often the one left at home to load something and then ratchet them down. I never get them threaded the right way. I have them backwards, so then I'm ratcheting against the trailer and it never works. I've maybe been known to throw a ratchet strap across the yard because I can't get it threaded through properly. So, you know, what's wrong with good old yellow rope that you could just put over your load and tie it down with a good old square knot? That's what I want to know. I will say when they work correctly, they're immensely satisfying, but yeah. getting them to the point that they will work oh. correctly or being on the other side of the load from the person who just tosses the ratchet end over to you. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't yeah, need yeah. my face. It's all right. <laughs> it's not doing anything anyway. Exactly. Ugh, like, I, yeah, they're obnoxious. I feel like this is another one of those things that people assume women are bad at because we're women and not because we just don't have the brain space to maintain yeah. which way to thread a ratchet strap. Like, I'm sorry that it's not on my list of things to devote energy to. No, but I then say people assume yeah. that it's because you're a girl. I'm awesome at a whole lot of things and I have no problem bringing up what I'm not awesome at. And ratchet straps are one of those things I am not awesome at. Plus you're in good company. <laughs> So, Arlene, what do you have to cuss and discuss? So, I have joined a few different ag women's groups on the mm. Facebook. And sometimes they can be very supportive places, and sometimes they can't. And um, if you want a really supportive one, you can join the Barnyard Language Facebook community because we are awesome. And it's not just for women. But the comments that get me the most are when you have someone make a post about, you know, a challenge in their life and they're wanting their partner to step up. Typically it's a man and the other women will tell them basically suck it up buttercup. He's a farmer, he's busy and you'll just have to figure it out without him. Like why are we expecting so little? Oh from our partners that we would tell another person to also expect so little from their partner that they shouldn't be expected to do the basics of putting their own children to bed. You know, it's it's not big stuff here. Like we're talking about things like coming home every once in a while so you can put their their own kids to bed, giving their kids a bath, you know, like cleaning up after themselves. Like these women are not asking for the world. They're asking for basic partner yes. skills. <laughs> And, and other women are saying, oh, that's, you're asking too much. I'm sorry. That is not, that's not asking no. too much. 
if you're in a part if you're in a partnered relationship and you decided to have children together even if you didn't decide to have children if you have children together this is something you're doing together and just because you're a man doesn't mean you don't need to participate and women don't need to be telling other women that that is asking too much and has anybody ever asked the man like I, they truly enjoy most as just as much as women to come put their kids to bed at night and be part of all of that and i think sometimes people just assume they don't want to be there and that's not true they they're part of the deal they want yeah. to be there yeah exactly i'm gonna go ahead and point out too that especially with infants a lot of dads don't get the practice with the babies and then people give them a hard time for not being good with the baby Yes. Like, well, I'm spending 24 hours a day with the kid and he's spending, you know, two hours a day with the kid because nobody's cutting him any slack to spend more time with the kid. And then, you know, you can't be mad that he doesn't know how to do X, Y, and Z because he doesn't do it. I mean, it's, you well, know. And then when they say, it's so nice that dad is babysitting his children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that should no. not be yeah hire a baby we talked earlier yes go ahead and hire a babysitter but yeah uh, yeah Dad, dads, dads are not babysitters. babysitters dads are dads unless they're babying sitting somebody yeah. else's kids there you then go oh yeah yes. they can baby someone else. <laughs> yeah that's maybe true. we should just that's a different arrangement agree to all expect a reasonable amount from each other yeah because <laughs> we expect i think that's the problem is that it's so random of when and who we expect way too much of and when and who we don't expect anything of and you know maybe we could just expect a normal amount from everybody and um, exactly you know if there's stuff we still can't do maybe yeah. we just shouldn't do it <laughs> no yeah or ask someone else for help who has exactly skills. and don't be scared to do that we don't we don't need yes, to have all the right. skills yeah well, we've solved the entire world's all of the problems. So I, yes. I think we yeah, can, from ratchet straps yeah. to uh, exactly <laughs> marriages. Yeah, we're we're good to go. Thank you so much, Allison, for joining us on the podcast today. If people want to connect with you online to order a Navigate 2023 planner, where can they uh, find They you? can find me on Allison Weaver, her story with Instagram and Facebook, or you can go to AllisonWeaver.com and hit the shop button and you okay. can order a Navigate 2023. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. It was great it was to have you. Allison. It's been fun, you guys. Thank you for joining us today on Barnyard Language. If you enjoy the show, we encourage you to support us by becoming a patron. Go to www.patreon.com backslash barnyard language to make a small monthly donation to help cover the costs of making the show. Please rate and review the podcast and follow the show so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Barnyard Language, and on Twitter, we are Barnyard Pod. If you'd like to connect with other farming families, you can join our private Barnyard Language Facebook group. We're always in search of future guests for the podcast. If you or someone you know would like to chat with us, get in touch. We are a proud member of the Positively Farming Media Podcast Network.